So hello, I'm, I'm Charlotte McMurchy. I'm one of the board members at WISH. Um, and in my other life, I am a, a property litigator. So what that means is that I sort out disputes, actual or, or potential in relation to land and property. Um, I manage a team of lawyers. I look after clients. I win new work um, and oversee the people side of our legal services business, liaising with our HR director and our managing partner. What do I actually want? Well, what I seem to want is more time. Um, much like everybody else, I've got a never ending to do list. Um, there are not enough hours in the day to achieve it all. What would I do with more time? I think probably this. I am shattered most of the time, um, pretty much like everybody, I imagine. But when we were talking about uh, this session, um, what is it that women want? I looked, I was thinking about things um, that sometimes it's easier to say what is not working before you can locate the thing that might work. And actually it may not be the, the direct invoice of, inverse of the thing that's not working, if you see what I mean. From my perspective, it was easier to look at life and identify what's not working rather than specific wants. Um, because as I said before, sometimes the things that would make life easier are actually not practical or possible. So I looked at my, my job. Um, my job involves an awful lot of thinking. And in order to do my job really well, ideally what I need are absolutely no interruptions. So I can have the space to think about the problems that um, I need to solve for people. So actually what I need is no contact with anybody at all to enable me to do the best job possible. But actually that's not realistic. I need contact with others to generate work to progress the matters that I'm working on. So what I think is actually the answer um, isn't. I then looked at how we would approach this task of what do women want? Um, and I looked at if I didn't have to do X then I could do Y. And at the time that we were talking about this, a new school year had started. So much like the rest of you, I imagine on this call, routine is uh, get up at 6.45 for one child who needs to be out on the school bus for 7.30. Then I walk the dog. Then I take the other child to school for 8.45. Continue on to the office to start the working day to get there um, at my start time of 9.30. So generally I would be able to get in there by 9.27. Sometimes you'd have roadworks, who knows? But it wasn't a happy state of affairs for me or to be honest, um, my children or my family. It was, I was slightly harassed and my thoughts were always on getting to the next thing. Um, and the list of jobs that I've just talked about is called trip chaining. Um, there's a fantastic book. I have, I'm not on any type of commission, but a fantastic book by Carolada, Caroline Criado Perez, which talks about uh, data bias um, in a world designed for men. And she, I don't know whether she coined this phrase trip chaining, but it is about where you have loads and loads of things to do in an allotted time. Um, and it's pretty stressful. So with COVID, um, we've all been working from home. And what actually this meant for me was that the trip to school was just that. Um, I wasn't adding in another trip to the office. And more importantly, I didn't have to be office ready, hunting down everything that I need for the day, laptop papers, actually getting dressed, um, making sure, you know, there's always those jobs to be done at lunchtime, making sure that those, I had all the relevant bits and pieces to do those jobs. So instead, what I'm able to do now is the drop off in a really, well, I say really relaxed manner. That's an absolute fib because we've still got to get Elizabeth dressed, willing to go to school, have some breakfast, make sure she's got all the things that she needs and get out the door. But the fact that I'm able to focus on that one particular task um, does make it more pleasurable for both of us. And on the way back, because I've done that job, I'm, I'm in the zone ready to get on with work. Um, and generally I start the day much earlier than the 9.30 um, that I'm supposed to. 
And that got me thinking about the foundations of the traditional working day. So we're looking at nine to five, and that's been expanded to include breakfast meetings and an evening gets to get together so that we squeeze absolutely everything we need, I need, I'm going to put in inverted commas, to do that day. And what this does is unintentionally prevents those who've got other external timetables from actually being able to participate. I'm reading a lot of a lot of books about all sorts of stuff. And there's a, another great book by a lady called Helen Lewis, who talks about society's need for children, that they are, in fact, the workers that will enable all of us to draw our pensions. So somebody needs to look after the little blighters. Um, and at the moment, it seems to be predominantly the women. So a nine to five day really doesn't help us if we are the primary carers. And the nine to five day doesn't help men if indeed they are the primary carers or caring is shared. What do we need to do about it? Well, I'd like you to meet the rock stars of um, the legal world. And in, in ser all seriousness, uh, the one on the left, uh, you may remember from having seen her perform when the Supreme Court dealt with the um, challenge to Parliament proroguing. This is uh, Lady Brenda Hale, who was the first woman Supreme Court judge and the president of the Supreme Court until January this year. She is known as the Beyonce of the legal world. Um, she was dubbed that by a legal blog, Legal Cheek, and she is um, an impressive woman, a really impressive woman. The lady on the right is known as the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Both of these ladies have paved the way for phenomenal changes, but they've had to be exceptional. And this doesn't seem fair that to succeed where, so if I can give you the example in, in the Supreme Court, there were two ladies before Lady Hale retired, there were two lady justices on that Supreme Court, it's made up of 12. And these two ladies had to be exceptional to get on there. I'm not saying the men aren't exceptional, but it can't be the case that they are equally as exceptional um, and, and women generally are not. So what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said was that women need to be where the decisions are being made, but they also need to be there in sufficient numbers so their voices can have an impact. And I think that's the key thing. We don't have to be stellar. I mean, we, we obviously, we all are ladies. We know that we are. But there needs to be an inequality that you don't have to be overperforming to enable you to be at the top table or in, in, at any table where changes are going to be made. So the things that I was thinking about are um, identifying what's not working what things would work and why aren't things working? And it's um, fabulous to hear Ian's um, empirical evidence about what actually does work when you remove that traditional nine to five, because I think we are way past nine to five now. But though I hope my thoughts help you with your chats in the breakout rooms later. Um, and as Ian said, if there are any questions, then I'm very happy to answer them. That was brilliant, Charlotte. Thank you so much for sharing your personal insights to that, because I think um, it, it does just make it come to life and it makes it so real. I think so many people are experiencing what you're experiencing there. Um, and I know in some of the in some of the WhatsApp chats, people are saying, oh, that is just amazing to, 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 um, to share. Um, that degree of insight. So we do really appreciate that. Um, I'm delighted to say we've um, we've got Julie um, on. Um, I'm sorry for your connection issues, Julie. Um, hopefully, um, Tracy will be able to get your um, slides up onto the screen if I can pass over to, to Tracy. I don't have the slides. So I'm, just, I'm hoping Julie's got hers. So <laughs> have you got your slides, Julie? I certainly have. I'm just trying to work out how to uh, how to share them because I'm a little bit more off here with Teams than I am with Zoom. So uh, you might need to talk me through how I how I how I share them. You should at the bottom of your computer have a, a share green... screen. Yeah. So just Fabulous. That, and then you should be able to choose the window that you want to share. Okay. 
Brilliant. Fabulous. Fabulous. Over to you, Julie. OK, well, first of all, um, I just want to say um, a huge thank you for um, for asking me to come along this morning. It's my first experience of a WISH meeting and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to joining some of the uh, breakout rooms. I suppose by way of introduction, my name is Julie Brayson and I'm Director of Transformation and Culture at Believe Housing. Um, and I've been asked to come along, I guess, and talk about what we've done um, or, have, or are focusing on at the moment to make the workplace equitable for women. And actually, when I started to pull together um, this presentation, I struggled a little bit because I think what we've done over the last kind of few years specifically and what we're planning to do moreover is to make the workplace equitable for people. And lots of things that I, um, I started to think about um, haven't specifically necessarily targeted women, but have had a knock on effect in terms of making life easier for them. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the things that we have done in our um, in our property repairs area, which has 190 people working on it. And out of those 190 people, 182 of them are men. Um, and tends to be an area that we we don't think about much in terms of how it, how it makes women's lives better. But I would like to talk a little bit later on about how actually allowing some of these gentlemen to attend their children's sensitivity plays um, or take their kids to the doctors for their vaccinations um, or actually make it OK for them to request an early finish or a late start in turn releases some of that burden, I think, from from us as potentially the um, the main carers or caregivers. So, yeah, I struggled a little bit in terms of this, but I would, would like to talk this morning, I think, about what we've done to make life equitable for people and how that in turn has a, a knock on effect of, um, on what it does for women. So um, we have um, been working actually over the last year on something called Believe in Balance. Um, we all know about the COVID effect and one of the things that we found is that um, rather than actually people working less during COVID, people are working more and that's causing additional strain for us. And so we've been really trying to think about what does balance mean for us? And it means work-life balance, but it also means looking after yourself and taking care of your mental health, your physical well-being, um, and putting yourself in a place to be able to cope with all the stresses and strains of, I guess, modern life and working life, but also what's happening in the wider world at the moment. Um, so a lot of things that I talk about this morning will fit into that. So, um, I just want to share, and you've probably all seen this, but I just wanted to share a little bit of um, research with you. So um, I thought this was a really interesting quote um, that I came across when I was preparing for this morning's presentation. In a year marked by crisis and uncertainty, the world of work is at a crossroads and the choices organisations make today will have consequences on gender equality for decades to come. I think that's really true. Um, so research suggests that COVID-19 has set back the progress of women in the workplace by half a decade, um, which is devastating when you think about the hard work that we've all been doing um, to get to where we currently are. And I think, you know, I've started to think about why is that the case? And for me, the boundaries between work and, and home have never been more blurred. And it really has created for all of our colleagues this always on culture. So we're always on from a work perspective, because actually previously we may have had that physical break between closing the laptop down, getting in the car and driving home, which gives you, I think, that opportunity to close off from the day, unwind and get ready for, for what happens when you, you go home. And in, that, in the same, that happens in the morning. It's not the case now and that laptop's there all of the time. It might be switched on still on the, on the kitchen table, the phone's there. There's a temptation, you know, to almost say, well, why aren't I working? Because I can't, I can't be going out anywhere. I can't be doing anything. Um, so it feels like there's increased pr pressure. And lots of people have now replaced their commute with actually just additional work time. Similarly, we've got family members in, in the home. I mean, I, I've got my husband working next door and I've got my 17 year old son studying for his A-levels upstairs. So whilst I'm always on potentially um, at work, I also feel like I'm always on at home too because I'm constantly getting those kind of small queries and questions. And certainly I've made really great friends with my Amazon and Hermes delivery drivers through COVID-19 as well, because life has come into the workplace in a way that I think it never has before. So it really does feel, I think for lots of us, very intense um, and difficult to manage. And we know that women um, are much more likely to have been furloughed um, or made redundant, and that's particularly prevalent for women of colour or from different ethnic minorities. Um, and actually, that has a huge impact because some of those women tend to be lower paid um, and that tends to have a bigger impact on their household, too. Um, so that set them back in terms of their career. And we're seeing many women now who are trying to get back into the workplace, having been made redundant, taking much lower paid jobs or, uh, you know, 
I guess, not utilising their, their role, their skills fully. Um, as many as one in four women are considering downshifting their careers or leaving the workplace altogether. And that's really concerning because we're going to potentially see this huge kind of talent and skills dream where people just decide this is too difficult for me to manage. I don't want to continue to work in this way. And then what does that do in terms of the, the role modelling um, for younger women who are considering starting a family, start, you know, progressing in their career? Does that potentially put them off? And actually, you know, what will that what impact will that have in the next 10 or 15 years? School and childcare closures and restricted access to family members who provide childcare um, and those caring responsibilities have all continued to impact women disproportionately. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting is the subliminal messaging. So we talk a lot, don't we, about um, how the burden sits with women. Um, but I don't know if any of you read the guidance that came out from the government about um, how we're going to manage this window of five days where we can see our family and friends. And there's lots of guidance there about we mustn't play board games because we're sharing materials and we must keep the rooms well ventilated, etc. But interestingly, the government's guidance says that the um, the burden of creating a happy Christmas for families and family traditions sits largely with women. And I can see Suzanne nodding, so I'm wondering if she's read it. It's it's a really quite disturbing piece um, because the government's own advice for Christmas more or less says the responsibility for this sits with women. So. That really concerns me in the, in the sense that we can do everything we can in terms of breaking down these barriers and putting in, in place that, that practical support for women. But if the subliminal messaging is you, this is your responsibility and it sits with you, it's really difficult for us to uh, manage. And it brought back to me the words of somebody who was a great mentor for me when I um, started taking some steps on my career. And they said to me, you do realise forevermore you will feel guilty when you're not at home. Um, and about all the things that are happening at home. And when you're, you know, when you're at home, you'll feel guilty because you're not at work. And I think, I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of, of making some of these moves clear. But I just wanted to highlight, I guess, some of the challenges that I think are sitting in our way. Um, but I do think for us, although that's quite worrying and some of those statistics are concerning, I also think that this crisis represents a huge opportunity for us because we've now got a real Biden platform and it's given us the energy to do some things differently. And I'll talk in a minute about some of the proof of concepts that we've um, been able to kind of explore in um, Believe that has actually almost said, do you know what? We don't have a reason now to tackle some of this stuff. Yes, it's concerning that we've got an impact here, but we've also got a massive opportunity to do some things differently. So um, we've been working differently at Believe for some time now. We call it working the Believe way and you can see some pictures of there of our lovely new office environments. Unfortunately, we don't get to play in them as much now as we'd like to, um, although we're all looking forward to getting back to them. Um, but we started this journey some time ago and it was really around helping people to be the best that they can and creating an environment where everyone could fulfill their potential. We have a, a mission around a life without barriers and that's really important to our customers but it's equally important to people who work with us. And I guess essentially, you know, people say to me, well, what is working the Believe way? Um, working the Believe way is about taking away the barriers that get in the way of people being the best that they can be every day. And it's about removing some of those things that stop them from doing that. It put us in a fantastic position to be able to, to respond to the current challenges, but it's almost also really helping us to think about, you know, how we do make things equitable and how we make them balanced and how we make them fair. So I just wanted to touch on what actually that means on pra um, in practice. So it's based on the following principles. And it's about empowering customer colleagues through a culture based on trust. So this is very much around allowing people to make decisions about where they work and when they work. Um, I'm going to be really clear it's not agile working. Um, this is um, the believe way of working, which means that you can choose where you want to work on any given day, whether that be from your home, whether it be in the offices, whether it be in Costa Coffee. Um, we have no we have no desire to enforce where you need to work and we don't need you to tell us. Um, you can make that decision for yourself because we trust that people are able to make that decision. It means that they don't have to make unnecessary uh, journeys to the office um, for some of our colleagues and customer services or property repairs. They don't have to come to the office to check in before they go out on their on their rounds. You know, it cuts down that kind of unnecessary time and it allows people to make those great decisions about where they can be that adds the right kind of value. We're also constantly developing a culture of innovation. Um, and yes, there's some huge innovation projects that we're working on, which will benefit the whole organisation. But most of the time, this is about the little things that people can do 
to work more effectively and get rid of unnecessary bureaucracy processes and procedures that don't make a difference because actually while a lot of our people are contracted for 37 and a half hours the reality is if they can do that work really effectively in 30 hours or 32 hours and that gives them more time to spend with their families then we're fine with that this is very much about working in a way that is based on people's outcome productivity and performance and not on the hours that they spend at work and in order to help us do that, we've launched um, something which is quite pioneering. It's a, it's a system called Staff Circle. So we started to think about if we're moving to this way of work, and this is quite challenging, because previously you can see your colleagues sitting next to you, you know that they're at work from nine till five. That's my measure of whether they're working or not. And one of the big boundaries that got in our way with this was helping managers and leaders adjust to that different way of working and managing based on productivity rather than bums on seats. So in order to do that, we had to give them the right tools to do it. So we have an integrated system, which we launched this year called Staff Circle, which is an integrated performance and culture system. So um, people can set objectives in Staff Circle and you can see when, you're, when your team have achieved their objectives. So you can do that weekly, monthly, however often you want to do it. But I'll get a push notification um, if members of my team have achieved an objective and they can attach a photograph um, if they're out and about and they want to, you know, my comms team want to send me something they've done or a video or they can a document, whatever that might look like. But I can see who's performing and where they are. So I know what the performance of my team looks like at any one time. Um, you can get feedback from other people in the organisation. So if members of my team are working on cross-functional projects, I can invite other members um, of the project team to give me feedback on their performance. We have those kind of in the moment chats over Staff Circle and all of that feedback is collated and we can see what's happening. Staff Circle also analyzes the analytics between of the engagement between line managers and their colleagues. So we can see which line managers are engaging regularly. So they may not be together in the same room, but you know they're looking at their colleagues' objective completion, they're giving them feedback, they're inviting feedback from the people, and we can ascertain how healthy that relationship is based on that kind of information. I also talked about being an integrated culture system, and it is, so we've woven in that our values and our behaviours, and we can get feedback on that, which gives us a really rounded picture of people. And we've removed the ordinary performance agreement with what we call the circle of success. So instead of just looking at someone's completion of objectives, we look at their personal well-being, we look at their relationships with their colleagues, we look at their achievement against objectives, their personal development, and they rate themselves on each of these areas. Um, their colleagues also rate them on each of these areas in terms of what they're observing um, and their line manager rates them too and you end up with three circles the colleague circle the feedback circle and the manager circle and that now is the basis of our performance conversations and i can log on at any one time and see how my team circles are changing which will make, give me that really good kind of shout out to say i need to have a conversation with rebecca for instance because actually i'm looking at this and our performance is great she's achieving our objectives but that little side of the circle that looks at well-being and relationships that needs some work and is she performing the expense of some of those things so that's true to form my uh, my door's just gone apologies <laughs> <laughs> but that's a really good example of how um, we are able to give people the correct tools in order to be able to make the most out of working more flexibly. Um, it's also about, you know, improving people's work life balance. And I talked about not necessarily logging how many hours people work. It is about focusing on those outcomes. And it's also about reducing our costs by making the best use of our assets. So we've recently rationalised our offices. We previously had seven offices and we've gone down to two believing that actually work is something that you do and not somewhere that you go. And our office spaces are now really collaborative. They're places that you go to, I guess, engage and be creative. Um, and we don't need a space for all of our people to sit in the office at any one time because they're able to be where they need to be. And we can make the workplace somewhere that people want to visit um, for collaboration purposes as opposed to somewhere that they have to go. And it's about reducing our environmental impact as well. So getting rid of some of those unnecessary journeys that people don't need to make. And actually, you know, a lot of those journeys took place between kind of eight and nine thirty in the morning or four and six in the evening. Time spent commuting in cars, we've given that up to, to, a, to, a, to a huge degree. It's reduced our impact and our cost, but it also means that people can be where they need to be at those times. Um, and usually that's on the school run um, or, you know, cooking a meal for the family or whatever it needs to be done that makes a difference. In order to do that, as I say, we give people the tools. Staff Circle is one of those examples. Um, the tech and the, you know, the, the kit that they need in order to be able to work in this particular way. 
and the support and the development and that's been a big part of our journey over the last year is particularly supporting line managers to feel comfortable with this way of working and let go of some of their old habits and beliefs um, so that they can really embrace and support the, their colleagues to get the most out of this. And I think um, we saw a particular impact on this um, over COVID because we were we'd already been working in this way for some time. And we really quickly needed to say, well, what are we going to do around things like homeschooling um, and how are we going to support our colleagues who are affected, um, who have caring responsibilities and carers are no longer you know, available? What does that look like? So we went out to every colleague in the business, whether male or female, and asked them what their caring responsibilities were, what pressures they had in terms of homeschooling. Um, a large proportion of our trades department, we were unable to get out to work during the first lockdown because they couldn't complete some of the non-essential services we previously did. And we made decisions about who we would stand down. We didn't furlough anybody, but we did stand some people down and allow them to work from home and do a kind of diagnosis over the phone and all that kind of stuff. And we made decisions around that based on actually who needed that support because they were struggling to get out and work. And our colleagues really appreciated that. Um, and, and, and they were then able to, to, to share some of that burden of homeschooling, etc. We also said that actually during the, you know, the previous lockdown where schools were closed, that nobody was being expected to work their contracted hours, that people could work whatever they could, and we would support them as an organisation. And you might think, well, that's absolutely crazy. You know, how do you get the out outcome? What we found was productivity increased because people would log on, you know, do a couple of hours of work before the kids got up, do the homeschooling during the day, and then people would get involved in other activities in an evening or weekend. And actually, we found given that trust and empowerment to do that, meant we got more back as an, as an organisation in terms of productivity than we could have expected. So not only have we been able to maintain our services, we've been able to improve our customer satisfaction rates and we've been able to push forward with some of our really big projects. And I think that's the point I wanted to make. You'll see here a picture of a whole family who work for Believe, working from home at their kitchen table. Um, so every every member of this family is employed by Believe Housing. And here they are um, during the first lockdown, engaged in proactive calls to customers, um, you know, their ordinary day to day work. And for me, one thing COVID has done for us is it proved, it's proved there's no reason to say no. So all the fears that people have about what will happen to productivity if you give people this level of trust and autonomy, um, it's completely it's completely taken that away from us as a barrier because as I say, we've been able to prove that not only can we continue to deliver services, but we can do them better. And we can do it with a fantastic level of engagement from our people. So uh, for me, it's definitely provided proof of concept of work in the Believe way. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about, um, I guess, this morning was um, our positive role models. So we have a senior leadership team made of our executive directors and also directors, and I'm one of them. Um, that team, when it's at full strength, has 11 and six of them are women including myself. Um, and you see some of those um, fabulous women there in front of you today. So we've got the Gordon, our finance director, Nick Turner, our executive director of community, customer and communities, um, Kate, who's our director of development and Rachel, who's our director of property services. We're particularly proud that we have some women in our director team in, in some previously or more traditionally thought of male roles. So particularly Kate, who's our Director of Development, looks after our, our new build, and um, Rachel, who's our Director of Property Services. Um, and that's fantastic um, that we've got those strong women in those um, in those roles really kind of flying the baton. And we hope that really encourages, you know, all of the women in our organisation to aspire um, to those types of roles and certainly some of our, you know, younger women coming through school and education. But one of the things that I particularly value and love about um, the women who are part of our senior leadership team is that they are real. I have a massive concern, that, particularly in the media, and I, I talked earlier on, didn't I, about this kind of perception that we create, even the government's paper that says that women should bear the burden of um, Christmas. That when we talk about women in senior positions, we have this stereotype that they are going to look like something from um, a TV commercial and be incredibly well groomed with glossy hair and designer suits and that they go to the gym in the morning before they come to work and they have a manicure at lunchtime and they cook their children organic food and they live in a perfectly, um, you know, tidy house where everything's perfect and they attend all of their um you know PTA meetings and all of this kind of stuff and I can see people smiling but if you watch TV that is absolutely the perception that's created um 
And I, what I love about the women who work in our organisation is they're really honest about the challenges that they face. And over the last few months, we've been writing a series of blogs and we've been really open about um, the impact that things like COVID has had on our mental health and our ability to be able to not see loved ones and give them a hug and what it feels like to have you know, all of your family in, at home and, and struggle with homeschooling um, and what it feels like to have your dogs, your frogs, your children join the conference calls, sometimes inappropriately. Um, and I think that's been hugely powerful. We've got lots of feedback. Um, we've done this all with the men in our senior leadership team as well, to be honest with you. And that's had a big impact, particularly for our, our, our gentlemen in, in property services. But we've been really honest about actually the realities of juggling working life, um, parenthood, and um, homeschooling and the impact of COVID and all of those kind of things. And we don't try to paint a picture that's unrealistic. Um, and I think that's really powerful and something that I'd like to see more of, I think, as we progress in the future, just people being real, because this stuff's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would have it cracked and we'd all be there already. Um, so I guess in summary, I think we've done a lot. I've made some real progress, but for us, we know that there's a long way to go um, and we're really at the start of, of a continued journey. We don't think we'll ever get there. We think we'll continue to evolve and shape as the, the world evolves and shape and the people who, who work for us needs change as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for asking me to come along this morning. Thank you so much for that, Julie. That was absolutely brilliant. Really inspirational stuff. Um, love the offices the office the offices <laughs> do look amazing um we talked about having an event in um at, oh, yeah. at believe when we were when we were um allowed to um so that that would be fantastic um i loved the photo as well of everybody working round round the same table um i just know over the over the pandemic i've spoken to a number of people and quite often you think that everybody's got the same setup as as you and <laughs> quite often that's that's not the case no. Um, and so seeing that photo, I think, was was a really, really strong image. Um, I think what was interesting, because I, I, I um, when, when we set up Wish, I, I did genuinely have a bit of a, a challenge locally about, is a women's networking group still relevant in the 21st mm -hmm. century? I did really challenge myself about that. And then this morning when I was I was driving the band to school and he, he said, what are you doing today? And I said, I've got a, I've got an event on what women want. So he said, what what do we, women want? <laughs> and I gave him a few examples and he said, well, isn't that what people want? And I mm. said, yeah, it is. But pish wouldn't sound the same as wish. <laughs> um, and then I, I think when when we do these events um and you you get the sense of energy from them um i do think yeah we will continue with wish whilst people still come still keep coming um and still keep wanting to share the stories because i think this is a place where people can can feel safe and can feel vulnerable and can have some really honest conversations and keep it real so thank you thank you so so much for that um we are going to do some some questions but i'll i'll keep it um, I'll keep it relatively brief, but there are some questions appearing in the chat, so I think it's yeah. I think it's important that we um, that we do give people the opportunity to have some um, have some answers to them. So the, the first question was it was it was um, for Ian, but um, I think it was it was about have carbon thought about removing hours in the terms and conditions um, and maybe even holidays so that you employ people to do a job and it's the outcome and the performance that's important. Um, a job is some, something we do, not where we go. So it'd be interesting to know if, if you have had those conversations in the organisation about, is it still relevant to have, to have hours and annual leave days? Um, or should you just trust people to get on and, and do the job? Yeah, thanks, Colin. I think that was from, from Dawn. Thanks for the question, Dawn, I think. Um, We've got to be honest and say that we probably haven't gone that far yet about looking to remove hours and, and looking to remove um, annual leave, as you would call it. Um, not saying that that can't happen in the future and it can't be a discussion. Um, but we've the feedback that we've got so far is that people still want to have some kind of structure. They don't necessarily want to leave it all behind, if that makes sense. Yep. I think the bit that we're looking at at the moment is how we balance that piece of providing people with the trust and the empowerment to make their own decisions, but make sure they feel comfortable making those decisions. Because a lot of it can come back to people feeling as though they've got permission to do that. So that's a bit of a cultural shift for us as well, I think, um, at this time. 
Um, I think um, we're definitely looking at that shift from presenteeism, though. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the recent period shown us that people don't need to be in the office to be productive. If anything, they're more productive when they've got the choice of where they want to work. Absolutely. And that's absolutely definitely the direction of travel that we're, we're looking to take a carbon. I mean, the presentation showed the evidence that, that we've got. We can't ignore the evidence. Um, otherwise, we're going to go backwards. And I think um, also in the chat, I think it was Carolyn mentioned, you're absolutely right, Carolyn. This is going to be part of our offer to attract the best talent and the best people out there. Um, so I think we're certainly of the view that we will be sit well, we, we just can't afford to, to go back to where we were, simple as that. Um, so I guess that's a long winded way of, of, of outlining the direction of travel that we're taking. Yeah, that, that, that's brilliant, Ian. Um, Julie, have, have you got anything that you would like to like to add to that? I think Ian's probably covered it on that one, to be honest with you. I mean, um, in terms of the, the holidays and the time policy, that's probably within our plan in the next 18 months. So we have a plan about what our next steps are. So say we've been kind of doing this believe we're working for some time now and we've seen that it's made a huge impact for us over the last few months about how we've been able to respond to the pandemic. But we're certainly looking at what the next steps are over the next 18 months. And one of the things on our um, phase two plan um, from January is to look at our time and attendance policy. Um, we don't think that there's probably a room for things like flexi time. We don't need to be logging hours if we're trusting people and empowering them to work in this way. And we have already had conversations about whether there still is a place for a number of contractual hours and what happens when it comes to holidays. But we have to do it in two phases. So the first phase is to look at this for the majority of our staff for whom this is fairly easy. So people like myself, you know, I'm not bound by customer needs. I can make those decisions myself about when the right time to be at work is. But that's very different if you're working in our customer hub um, and you need to be um, available to take calls from customers at the right time. Or if you're booked to go and do a repair to someone's home or if you're visiting the home during a specific time and it's slightly less flexible for those areas. So in phase one for us, it's looking at those colleagues for whom it's really easy to make those decisions and make, you know, a non-standard working hours and, and actually get rid of contracted hours for, for good, easy. But then the next stage is how do we make that equitable and fair for our colleagues who are in more demanding customer facing roles where they're bound a little bit more by the needs of the customer. So we, we are looking at that, but we're doing it in two phases. Brilliant. Yeah, that that that's um that's spot on. I think the the other question was about unconscious bias. Um, and I, I mean, I, I did hear some stuff which wasn't in the housing sector, to be fair, but it was it was about um, the impact that the pandemic could have on recruit recruitment of women moving forward. Um, bearing in mind that they maybe do bear the brunt of homeschooling and stuff like this. So if we hadn't come up with the vaccine and we were potentially going to be working like this for a long time, would that have an impact on the recruitment of, of women? Because organisations would be nervous about um, people being able to work at, at capacity. Um, and like I said, that wasn't in the housing sector. But I just wonder in terms of um, doing some work around that unconscious bias and what people's thoughts are. Um, Ian, have you, have you got any thoughts on um, what Carbon do in terms of unconscious bias? Um. I think it's probably fair to say that we've got a, a lot to do on that. I'll, I'll just be open and upfront in, in, in terms of this. There's, there's probably a lot of work that, that goes on behind the scenes. So I know Justine asked a particular question around recruitment. It's a really valid point. Um, what I would say is that I'm one of about 16 people in the People and OD team, and I'm the only male member of that team. Um, so in terms of the work that we do on um, making sure our adverts and job descriptions don't have that bias in them. We make sure that that happens. We do a lot of work to try and make sure that we can get involved in panels as well to, to balance those panels up um, on that specific request. But in terms of that unconscious bias um, piece in general, um, yeah, we've definitely got some more work to do on it without a shadow of a doubt. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, Julie, do you want to add anything into the mix? 
I think um I think probably kind of the new recruits that we've added to our um, senior leadership team have gone a long way to addressing some of that unconscious bias and now having kind of that really strong female presence amongst the senior leadership team has, has been great. Although recently in certain panels, we've had to make sure that we have a male presence, <laughs> a little bit like Ian said, we've had to make sure that actually we, we truly have that kind of gender equality. And obviously Judith's on the call today and, and she'll be aware that we've got quite a, um, a comprehensive plan um, for the next few months in terms of what we do around un unconscious bias and addressing equality in general. Um, and it's quite ambitious. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do as much of the things that we'd like to do around engaging with schools, etc. cetera, um, because of the pandemic, which has made things slightly differently. But we have got quite an ambitious plan. But like everyone, I think it's a work in progress. And the most important thing is to keep it on our radars and make sure that we don't assume that we've done it and it's we've ticked a box because we have a plan. I think it's important to keep challenging ourselves around it. Yeah, I think I think Julie's right, and, and um, I know that Di is on the call from Carbon as well. Di Keller, who's just recently joined us, um, so I already know that Di's got some major plans for us at Carbon, which are really exciting. Um, and I think it's probably similar to Julie. We probably haven't been able to to focus on some of the things that we would have already driven forward um, because of the pandemic. So it's had that type of impact on us. Um, but we're well aware of, of, of where we fall short, I think. And that's not to say that we're, that we're not making good inroads into these. It's just that we know that we've got more to do. No, that's, that, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, I think what, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the, into the workshops. Um, I was going to say, please don't drop off the call because it's, it's really important that we do get your insight in terms of what you would like to see on, on, on your wish lists. So Tracy, as if by magic, is going to throw us all into some workshops. If you have got um, somebody from the board on, on your workshop, then um, that person is happy to facilitate. If you haven't, can somebody please um, take on that, on that role? And I know Lucy and Karen have offered to facilitate as well. Um, and then when we come back, which will be in about 15 to 20 minutes, Tracy will um, pick on some people to, to give the feedback to the rest of the room. And I think what we need to hear really is just simply, um, if there's one thing that your employer could do to, to make life better at work, um, particularly for women, then what would that be? And like I said, what we're going to do with that is pull together a wish list um, and then work out how best to raise awareness um, and share good practice moving forward into next year. Um, and I think that WISH is well placed to do that as well as an independent organisation. Um, so we are really looking forward to that. But please, um, we're going to go out into the workshops now. Like I said, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes. So you've got maybe it's time for a quick cuppa and a quick, um, a quick toilet trip. Um, but please come back and then Tracy will pull us all back in and pick on a few people to, to feedback. OK, so thank you very much. OK, so I think you're mainly in rooms of four. Um, there might be people that have dropped off and come back in again. So I'll just um, rejig a bit once you get invited to the room. So you'll get an invite to go into the breakout room. So the, basically the thoughts are what what historically have a think about what's happened this year. What's gone well for you? What's come out that's been positive for you at work? And where's the challenges been? And where have the challenges been? And therefore, how would you like, what would you like to move forward? So you're looking at your knowledge, what's been and, and what's happened, but also this sort of future focused on what's going to really facilitate better outcomes for you in 2021. And that's what we want you to feed back on is that future focus. So, and I will just select, I won't pick on anyone. I will invite um, you to, uh, to share when we come back in the room. So see you all back here in about, let's give you, we'll give you 20 minutes so you can just pop off and have a loo break, but get back into those rooms. So go in the rooms first before you break, because otherwise you'll have one person sitting there on their own thinking nobody loves me and we don't want that. <laughs> so here we go. Welcome back everybody. So I'm just going to ask, invite um, a few people to feedback from their, their um, breakout rooms. Um, so I'm going to ask, I know Lucy, you were in a room with the, with the group. Would you like to just do some feedback of the, the, the key things that came out? 
Yeah, no problem at all. I mean, we had a really interesting discussion um, that, over that 20 minutes. We started off by talking about um, organisations supporting people back into work after a period away from work. So be that maternity, be that a period of being unwell, or even then we moved on to say that's equally the same when people are promoted, actually. So coming back to a new environment or going to a new environment, it's really important that organisations support people in that transition process. Um, you know, we briefly mentioned sort of mentors and, and people who can really help people with that because, you know, the world changes, the language can change in a period of time when people are off. Um, we then moved on to talk about understanding barriers and the really important role that managers have um, in, in knowing their people and taking the importance of having those conversations, taking the time to talk to their staff so that, you know, barriers or issues can be identified and dealt with and people feel confident to be able to talk about those. Um, that then moved us on to then talk about how perhaps in the COVID environment and the way that we've been working, we've lost some of that opportunity for informal conversations. So, you know, that quick chat whilst making a cup of coffee or whatever, where sometimes that can be, and somebody within our chat was from an HR perspective and said, actually, that a lot of their team was really missing that because that's where some of that informal or that knowledge about, you know, what might be happening or little rumblings going on. And, you know, um, that that's something that we're missing. We then talked about um, the, the wider sort of bit about, and the interesting um, insight that there's actually within housing organisations, there are a lot of staff who have been used to working in the sorts of ways that we're working now, you know, going from home in the van, out to do a job, not going into a workplace at any time. Um, and how interesting it is that now a load of us are also doing the same. We found all these ways, these innovative ways to engage, be that teams or whatever. And you think we never did that for those people before. And some, and some, some people were saying that that's now being received positively by those people saying, great, we're now engaged with teams. Whereas others are saying, oh, well, that's all well and good. You in the ivory tower, now it's happened to you. You thought of this stuff out, you never did it before. So um, really, really interesting discussion. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Lucy. So I'm going to, I just want to, pit, I really would like someone to come from one of the other rooms that uh, maybe speak for their room. And I'm looking at Emma Smith Lane. Some, something's attracting me to you, Emma. Sorry, I haven't made me notes. Karen's got me feedback notes. <laughs> I should. <laughs> Karen, are you all right to pick that up? Do you want Karen to do it, or are you comfortable? What? Karen's wrote everything down. I literally was just too engaged in the conversation. <laughs> all right, brilliant. Okay, well, there you go, Karen. Jean, that was swiftly handed over the baton. <laughs> You're on mute. Yeah. Do you want? Do you want to speak? Can you can you unmute yourself? Oh, it doesn't. It, it I can only have the function. It says. There you go. Oh, there there you go. You Sorry about that. Um, it wasn't letting me unmute for some reason. So we had a we had a really lovely conversation. I have to say, it was lovely to to check in with the the people there. We all used to work for the same organisation. So um, some of the, the the people in the room are still there. Some of the people in the room aren't there anymore. So it was like a lovely little reunion that we've had. So um, the the. The insights that we've identified really were around trust. You know, it's come up already so many times in, in the session that we've had. And it's really just hit home around how important that trust element is. And there seems to be such a strong correlation between if you've got a, a, a workforce that feels trusted, then you get that productivity. There's, there's definitely a direct connection there. So in terms of our wish list, if there was anything that we could do to enhance and increase that level of trust, that would definitely be there. And we talked as well about how important it is to have real people as role models. So we're not glossy all of the time. You know, we don't always look, you know, prepared. And sometimes it is a bit of a rush and that's absolutely fine. And sometimes we don't understand what the conversation is, is all about. And it's fine to ask questions and it's fine to admit that you might need a little bit of help or something. So again, if we could create that environment where that is welcomed and supported and understood, 
we just think that would go so far into creating that right kind of, of workplace. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So one of the other rooms, so I, so I now I could invite and, uh, and uh, so I could invite someone and see who your note taker was. So Abby, who was your note taker in your room? I unmuted myself. I'm not actually sure. I don't, I don't know if anyone was taking notes in our group. We were just totally engaged in the conversation, but I've jotted some stuff down. I can kind of remember what we talked about. If I've forgotten anything, I do apologize to the rest of the group because we, we had a really good discussion. Um, but we kind of we introduced ourselves because we were from quite a, a few different organisations um, and we just talked about our roles and how we found the organisation, how they've like dealt with the changes at the moment um, and whether we think they're good or bad. Um, and we talked about kind of the pros and cons of of the whole home working scenarios. So we were talking about how. Um, you know, teams meetings. Do we fe do we feel that the the constant need for teams meetings rather than the face to face office conversations are they stopping us getting our work done? Are we finding them too are taking up too much time, and um, so we can't get our actual productive work completed? And we find that are we working more hours because we're not commuting? And um, so we did talk a bit about that, but then we also on the flip side was talking about how we'll, we've learned new skills from working online more that um, we may not have learned up until this point so we've kind of evolved to the pace of the world and we've um like learned how to use zoom and teams and where we can drop files um and you know we were talking about if we ever did change into a job where it was even more prominent that we've learned them skills now um even though we've kind of been catapulted into it kind of against our will um we also talked about the balance of home working and office working and if we were to return to some sort of normality, what would we prefer? Um, most of us did say we would have preferred a mix still um, because we found it a lot easier with things like childcare um, and, and other aspects of, of just normal life that we found that a mix would be would be more beneficial. Um, and then we just kind of talked similarly about um, how like women as role models in the sense that like we always used to strive for like, bit per like perfection um, and now we're kind of a bit more relaxed and that we're used to dogs children appearing on the screen and deliveries and things that disrupt us so um I think that was kind of everything we talked about but no it was just lovely to speak to different different people and get their views lovely thank you thank you for sharing Abby now I'm going to go on screen two we've got two two screens if I can see anyone in here um, so if I just invite you and you might have already you might have been in a group that's already spoken just let me know so Sandy, we, uh, has your group spoken yet? Yes, I was with Abby. Oh, lovely. Okay, thank you. And so, Dawn? Um, Claire's got ours. She's, she took all the notes. Lovely. So where's Claire? Yeah, I'm yeah. here. Um, so we talked about some of the challenges, um, obviously, while we've been in the lockdown period around juggling responsibilities. So we had two males in our group which was really interesting because they faced the same kind of difficulties as us as women so um, sort of juggling the school run doing the home schooling um, maintaining the mental health during the period because obviously there's so many challenges that we've we've had to juggle and maintain and we talked about also the routine so we've gone from the routine of driving to the office doing your work coming home that's a big significant change as well so that was a challenge getting used to that we talked about um some of the the positives um we feel a lot more relaxed because we've got um more flexibility so we're not having that morning commute where we have to fight for a space and we're stuck in traffic and by the time you get to work you're stressed out we feel a lot more empowered to get on and do the job and with that empowerment comes more flexibility um, we talked about how we've always seen ourselves as being people focused but we've become really people focused throughout it so we've taken the time to actually listen to people you actually see the person um, as a whole as opposed to them sitting in their office in the nine to five job you get to see people in the home you get to see the family you get to, to see sort of the things that they do in their day-to-day -day lives so it gives you that depth of relationship with individuals um, we talked about the work-life balance um, 
things are a lot easier in some respects. So you can do your school run, you can pop your washing in in between meetings and things like that. So it's been great from a, a work-life balance perspective. Um, what we'd like to see more or less of, we talked about the flexibility that is really key, trust and after the, the genuine trust as well. Um, and if we had a magic wand on our wish list, the things that we, we would really like is to be able to maintain the social interaction. So while we're working from home, we've identified that obviously we're missing out on some of that social interaction and the informal things of going into the office, having a chat with somebody about what they watched on TV and things last night, um, having support networks as well. Um, it can become quite um, isolating and lonely when you start at home on your own, working from home. We talked about the genuine trust and flexibility. So those are our wish list items. Brilliant, brilliant. Well done, that group. So I'm gonna invite one more group to, to share. So who would like to share? I can't see everyone. Um, I, I will share because we haven't shared from our group and I was lovely. taking notes. Thank you, sir. Um, so we did something similar. We, we had quite a few people from different organisations, which was really good. Um, and a couple who were quite new to the, their organisations. So kind of joined during the uh, COVID um, kind of period of time. Um, so we kind of just had sort of, sort of general conversations about sort of the difficulty in that. Um, but how actually some of that was spurred on, some of that move was spurred, spurred on from, um, uh, from sort of the lack of flexibility. So one was returned from maternity leave. But the rigidity of the nine to five just wasn't possible um, and the organization just could not sort of bend uh, or, or flex at all so they look had to look elsewhere so we had a little bit of discussion about that about um you know external factors or change in lives can make uh, sort of stop you a, a, a being able to kind of do those core hours or those traditional hours um and so you tend to look for other alternative roles but then often that ends up being a little bit either you have to put your children, for example, in childcare, so you have kind of burdens of guilt on there or, or additional financial pressures, or you have to reduce your hours. And then often that ends up um, meaning that you've got to you go th um, have demotions. And I guess we kind of talked a little bit at the end around that about can organisations be more considerate in relation to roles and just all roles have to be full time? Do they have to be? Um, you know, kind of can they have flexible working? And it was one thing I got told I, I, from my pers personal perspective, I, when I created my roles, most of mine are all part time. And a big thing that I got from people was, thank you so much. I've been able to actually stay at a really decent level and not have to um, take, you know, but still be able to have part time hours and have that work life balance. Um, so, you know, with this kind of flexible working, can it also maybe consider you know, part time hours as the, the further you go up? because um, I think there's never there's never enough hours in a day in a, in a day to do your job anyway so actually could be more consideration in recruitment processes in relation to actual jobs um, that don't rely on people uh, to, so to, to take demotions um, and we talked a little bit around um, uh, those, so those external pressures around making sure it is equitable so I think a few things resonated with the, uh, with the organizations earlier on that they offer things to everybody so because you know when you have got pressures at the home where's the burden being pushed to so if you have got a male uh, you sort of the, the the men in the in the relationship who has to stick to a nine to five the burden is then pushed onto the woman but vice versa where's the burden being pushed to so if we can make sure you know if organizations are make sure and those policies are equitable across everybody it means the burden's not being pushed to somewhere else into childcare, financial the woman in the relationship or you know the daughter for, for elderly parents who are looking after and, and what have you um so we talked a, a bit about that we did say that it's obviously gotten a little bit better we hope uh, sort of since the since sort of you know over the last sort of 20 30 years and um, but there is that worry um that it's it's kind of getting it's sort of starting to happen again um and what we did say though we talked a bit around um how Gender inequality is, has always been there, but it's never been particularly prominent. And I think, you know, Caroline mentioned that earlier about we got, we challenged ourselves when we first set up WISH Northeast about, is this still a problem and social housing a problem in the sector? Um, and I think, you know, it was still very much wanted and it was still needed, but the pandemic has heightened it. And I think in a positive way, that's a good thing, but we wanted to kind of challenge employers to continue to consider gender equality when they're doing impact assessments. So really think from a bigger, broader perspective and not maybe just always look at 
individual policies but how multiple policies maybe in, in one big process do impact on each other so you might get one area really good but don't forget that other other areas that then might impact so kind of maybe making sure that impact assessments are really genuinely completed and genuinely evaluated and from a gender perspective um so that we can kind of continue to, to challenge and question is this going to have an impact you know on, on people disproportionately on, on women um so what else we talked about um uh, a little bit around um the, about having a women's group so we did talk about how it is really good to have this safe space where women can talk and discuss um but we also really like that it's not exclusive to women that it is new feminism isn't a women's issue it's everybody's yeah. issue um, and we, we talked about how positive it was that we had men involved in, in today's webinar and that actually we need to ensure that our women our voice is still being heard by male counterparts and and by um men in organizations to be those advocates and there are some issues that men can never know about until we tell them you know things like menopause and, and maternity um it's something that men don't experience so they need to be able to ensure that they listen to our voice and we have an, an, an ability to talk to them but that they can listen so we're really kind of quite positive about how this environment especially seems a very inclusive one and that we make sure that inclusive agenda continues on um and then what was it uh and about it is about a big sort of culture shift um and it's uh, and we talked about sort of that that how can we all work together to make sure we we support that culture shift because it is a big a big shift taking place so we kind of just kind of raise that as a general not necessarily an employer um ask but we did talk about that it is a big culture shift but um you know how can we how can we help people on that on that route to, to make those those changes and my only the one thing at the very end was that little bit and it was something that one of the people talked about we didn't get a chance to explore it but that out of sight out of mind concern and I think a lot of people who've been on maternity leave especially will have experienced that that once you're out the business or if you've been on sick leave you are often forgotten irrespective of whether policies say you're not it does feel like that you do get missed off email communications you do get missed off xyz um and even more so now when we're not in the office that concern happens even more if you can't make those daily check-ins when team meetings take place or if you can't um you know you, do, you don't have those like little interactions in kitchens if you're out of sight you are often out of mind and there is that worry of it's always been an issue and is it going to be continued to be an even worse issue moving forward and can employers think about about that a bit more mm -hmm. practical Absolutely. like practically yeah brilliant Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's some brilliant feedback. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Caroline. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was that was brilliant to hear all of that. I think um, in, in our session, um, we just talked about, will you just invest, get the technology sorted? Um, we need to be mobile. We need to be flexible. Just give us the kit to, to and trust us to do our jobs. It's all about leadership. We need to change the mindset, including our own. Sometimes, sometimes we can be our, we can create our own barriers. Um, we need to keep an open mind, and it is doable, as we've heard this morning. Um, it's absolutely doable, and those that don't adapt are going to be behind the behind the times. So um, we will pull all of that together. Um, the session's been recorded, so I'll be able to, to get more notes, and if the people who've taken the notes um, can forward them on and we'll we'll let you know how to do that after this after the session but that was a really really useful um session to get all of that insight so i've just got a few thank yous i'd like to thank you so much for not dropping off we've managed to maintain everybody's um engagement um in the workshop can i thank our speakers um ian julie and charlotte that was absolutely um inspirational um and so great to hear such um, role modelling in, in the sector. Um, your contribution is really, really appreciated. Can I thank the board who do work voluntarily and tirelessly behind the scenes to try and keep um, events like this um, going? Can I thank Tracy as well? Tracy is the chair of the London um, board and she's also got her own consultancy. Um, Curious Minds, is that right, Tracy? Yeah. Um, so please look her up. Thank you for giving us the time this morning to make sure that the, the tech works for us. Um, can I thank our sponsor? We're wishing Lucy and Karen from Positive About Inclusion all the very best. Please get in touch with them if you, um, if you want um, some work doing that and personally recommend them. Um, 
And don't forget, it's our Christmas quiz tomorrow night with the Institute of Housing. We're raising some money for um, MIND. Um, it's between four and six. The tickets are on our social media. It won't be as much as a challenge as it was getting tickets for this. Um, so thank you for joining us today, folks. Um, hopefully we'll actually see you in the new year. And maybe that might be in Believe's um, fantastic new, new offices. So thank you so much, folks. It has been lovely to see you. I've got a real energy from, from this morning. Um, and have a safe journey home. <laughs> Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.